Good morning. If y'all see the preacher sitting back to his seat, it's a joke. No, that's good. Good to be out and about. Glad to see a little sunshine. I hear we have a heat wave coming. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. Um, by way of announcements today, um, we have several things going on. Um, let's start with March 1st. March 1st. Um, God of Deliverance is a Bible study starting Tuesday, March 1st in the conference room. If you don't know where that is, that's in the little red uh, office building next door. Uh, but there's a conference room in there. The AM class is from 9 to 11. The PM class is from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, books will be given an introduction DVD. So uh, it should be a great, great Bible study. If you're interested in that, adding something to your life. Uh, I think it will. I think it'll be good. It'll be real good. Also, um, if you didn't know, Upward is almost, almost over. <laughs> Woo! I saw, I saw that. Aaron's like, yes, yes. It's a good day. No, it's, it's been a blessing. We've had a record numbers. Um, and just so you know, I'm excited about tonight. Tonight we're having a uh, kind of an, an outreach in reach. Um, and if you'd like to be a part of that, we would love your help and, and attendance tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll be in the gym, and um, I've, I've sent out reminders to, uh, to the, uh, the students there from kindergarten to fifth grade, so just like half of them, and I've asked them to reply and say, hey, let me know if you're coming, and they've lit me up. Uh, I've had uh, right at 100 people that uh, have committed to come tonight, and that's huge. It's not a Saturday. It's no ball game. They just come to join us. We're going to feed them. We'll have, we do have the inflatables out there, uh, but uh, I'll be giving a devotion, and we'll just have a time of worship and just tell them what, what our church has to offer and to love on them, and it's just a great, lot, great opportunity to take one more step into drawing them in to uh, this um, local body of believers. So be in, be in prayer. Even if you can't be here, please be in pr prayer. We just, just never know. As I look out across the crowd, we have several here from that ministry. So it's just an opportunity. Again, we, we could go out and knock on doors. But man, when they're walking in our front door, 
uh, we have a prime opportunity to show them love and kindness and just take time for that. So that's tonight. And uh, next uh, Sunday night will be the same thing, but for my middle schoolers. Uh, for Westworth, we have, I think it was, we have right at 80 middle schoolers playing up for this year. Um, so I haven't asked and got back a uh, word from them yet because I didn't want to muddy the water with that just yet. Uh, but uh, I'm excited about that. And next week we will follow that, that uh, evening up with a uh, coaches versus students basketball game, which is hilarious. You should at least show up for that alone. It's a lot, a lot of good, clean fun. Um, also, uh, the, the youth will be going to a conference uh, on, uh, in Murfreesboro, uh, March 11th. Let me clarify that. High schoolers. We're going to do a high school trip and uh, stay, stay tuned, uh, non-high schoolers. We will have a trip just for you, but it's nice to kind of, kind of you don't want to say divide in a Baptist church, right? But you want to kind of give them a chance to, 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 to have the older and some of the younger ones to, to kind of not be, feel the pressure to be so cool. So um, it's, a, it's a good time coming up, being prayer for that. Um, I heard great, great, uh, I even saw some incriminating photos from the trip to Hibachi this week. I think that went over pretty well, little giggles. Yeah, I know who you are. So um, let's sound like they had a great trip this week. And the coming, uh, this coming is the 27th, uh, Legacy 5 uh, is going to be at Oak Hill Baptist Church. So they'll be taking a group to do that. I'm excited, but that's a great group, great opportunity to go somewhere local and close for a great ministry opportunity. Um, anything I'm missing? Yes. Thank you. There is a Sunday school training. Um, thank you. I knew I was forgetting something. Sunday school training, that is March 20th. March 1st. March 1st. I'm not reading very well. March 1st, there's a, there's a there it is, I see it. Um, Sunday school still matters. It's a training at Eubank Baptist Church. If you're a Sunday school teacher or think about being a Sunday school teacher, or you just want something kind of to encourage you in your, uh, in just, you know, getting prepared, uh, that would be a great opportunity to go uh, and just kind of go, oh, yeah, I need to start doing that. Or that, that would make me feel a little more confident in my, in my Sunday school. So anyway, that's a good opportunity. We have several visitors with us today. Don't point. Don't look just yet. But uh, before the day is over, we, we do want to say thank you for being here. Welcome uh, to this phone. We've had several birthdays, several birthdays this week. I want to shout out to that. But if you're a visitor or a first-time visitor uh, for maybe in a while, we want to welcome you today in worship. Let's, let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the privilege of coming into your house to sing praises to your name, to get into your word so your word may get into us. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of being in your house today. Bless this time in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Stand with me this morning as we sing Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy I want to see you One more time Holy, 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 I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. High and lifted up, 
shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see you. Light of the world, you step down into darkness, oh. His heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together loving, all together worthy. All together wonderful to me King of all days, oh so highly exalted Glorious in heaven above Humbly you came to the earth you created All for love's sake Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together loving, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll never much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together loving, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, before Brother Corey comes up here and prays, I wanted to read Psalm 29. It says, Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful, and the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire, and the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as a king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people, and may the Lord bless his people with peace. Amen. I love that part about them all crying glory, don't you? One of these days we'll be with him forever, and I long for that. Um, 
remember to pray for our military. I know if you've got family in the military with everything that's going on in the world today, uh, even if it's on the other side of the world, it affects those uh, in the military and know their families. So let's pray for them uh, this morning. Father, we come before you. Uh, we thank you for this time that we can worship you uh, in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you, Father, that you are on the throne and, uh, Lord, you are in control. Lord, we pray for um, the peace that's available through Christ, Lord, to be experienced by as many people as possible while there's still time. And, Father, we pray for those that serve and protect, uh, particularly our military, be with them and their families during this time. And, Father, give our leaders wisdom. Father, we love you and we praise you and we pray for your kingdom to come just like you have promised that it, it is. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stand with me again this morning as we continue to sing and come into God's throne room in our hearts and sing glory to him. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God Our God Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And with our God is with us, then what could stand again? Then what could stand again? Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe is Then sing 
Jesus, my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art. How great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, when through the woods and forest lanes I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down on lofty mountain grandeur and hear the blue and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God is Son, not sparing, sent Him to die scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior God to thee how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. how great you are that you would indwell in us and make us your people that we might gather together and listen to your word and let your spirit and your word direct our lives father i pray this morning that you would open our hearts for your the seed of your word to be planted that it might be watered and fed and bear fruit in our lives it's in jesus name we pray amen jesus loves me this i know for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I um, I, when when I first came here, I don't know if y'all knew this. I don't think I've ever told this story. Me and Miss Stephanie were driving uh from from East Tennessee, and uh, we'd we'd taken a vacation and we'd we'd uh, flowed the Coe and had some good good fun, and we were heading down here to visit with Brother Corey, Miss Nancy, and Ethan, and and Elise, and we were just going to hang out and kind of, kind of fill out the area. And um, I, I, I made a wrong turn. I did. Matter of fact, my little phone app, like, it stopped. Like, we said, you know, navigate us. And we were going along. All of a sudden, uh, something happened. So I closed it out and thought I'd open it back up. And 
I had no service. And I was like, ah. And I was going, I think I turn right up here. And I started driving for a while. And, it, and it, the road went smaller and smaller and smaller. I thought, here in a little bit, it's going to become a dirt path. I mean, it was like scary. I was like, oh my goodness. So um, I, rem I remember I was checking my, it was doing nothing. So you know what I did? I pulled over. And I, I walked into this little, little mom and pop gas station. I said, I, I need direction. I'm trying to get to Somerset, Kentucky. Can you help me? And they were like, Somerset, Kentucky? I think I know where that is. And, and they, were, they were directing me to how to get back home to the main road. But I had to have that moment to where I raised my hand and said, I'm lost. Everybody do that. Say, I'm lost. I'm lost. I had to, I had to do that. And I, had to, I, had to, I, had to, I had to, think I had to give my man card up at that moment. Because men are bad about... Does your dad ask for directions? No. He said, "Row, row." No, and no. He said, "No, Ty." He said, "But no, like it's bad." It's like, "Oh, I'm not going." But I thought, "I'm just, I'm going to ask for directions." I pulled over and said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm going to ask." We're getting further and further away from where we're supposed to be. I know. I just kind of had a gut feeling, and sure enough, we had made a wrong turn. But sometimes we just need to go. You know what? I'm lost. And I love this story. There's a story. In Acts, it says, Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south on the road. Now, let's see, that's directions. Go south on the road um, to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem. So he started out, went on his way, and met an Ethiopian. Uh, he was an important official in charge of the treasury, a lot of money. He had a nice chariot. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way, home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, which is in the Bible, and, and by the prophet. And the Spirit told Philip, go over to that chariot and, and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading the Bible. He's, he asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless someone explain it to me? I think that's, I think that's kind of funny. Because he knew where he was going on the road. He wasn't lost physically. Like he was in his chariot. He had a nice car. And, and, and the prophet it said, ran up to him. He, he was walking. Like he didn't have a nice car. He was just walking along. And he sees this guy pulled over in the chariot, like looking at the map. You know, kind of like, but he wasn't looking at the physical map. He was looking at God's map. He's going, you know, I, I know it's talking about how I can know God better. But I just can't figure it out. And he's reading his Bible. He's looking at his map, and he's going, man, I, I, I'm not understanding this. And God kind of nudged, nudged him and said, go over and talk to him. So he went over and talked to him and said, hey, you look lost. And he wasn't lost like on the road, but he was lost. He couldn't, he couldn't figure his way. So he said, you know what? I, I am lost. I, I am lost. I, I need someone to, to tell me and show me who God is and and at that moment, that's the first step. That's the first step in coming knowing God. He's going, you know what? I don't know. I need help. And I love that God sent him to explain things to him in a very simple way. And he became a believer that day, which is really cool. Really cool. Matter of fact, when I, when I worked at Kaufman's, we, we used to laugh about this. When I worked at Kaufman's, um, people, I'd, I'd watch people answer the phone and give directions. And I, we had this little girl, she was brand new to the office, and she goes, hello, this is Kaufman, can I help you? And uh, she goes, yeah, you'll just turn right on the 45 and go down to, and I said, stop, no, stop. And she's like, what? one moment, please, what? I said, where are they? She goes, I don't know. I said, if you turn right on the 45, depends on where you are, you could be heading south, you could be heading north. She goes, it's oh, a good point. I said, always start is, where are you? It's a good place to start. So where am I? So we're going to pray and ask God to, to start moving in our hearts and showing us who he is. And as we listen to our Sunday school teacher, we listen to Brother Corey, and we hear God's word, that we can come to that moment going, God, who are you? So let's pray and ask God to help us with that. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us. And Father, I ask that you help us come to that place, maybe in our life, that we can raise our hand and say, I am lost. 
And I need directions to Jesus today. Father, I thank you for showing us in your word that we can look at as a map and as a love letter that will show us your heart and the way to connect with you. Father, I thank you for Sunday school teachers and moms and dads that help us understand. And Father, I pray that we just draw close to you today. I love you, Jesus. In your name, everybody said, Amen. 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 Good morning. We are now in a new uh, series this uh, today. Um, it's a we're going to go through the book of Titus in the New Testament. So if you know where that is, toward the back of the New Testament, the book of Titus. We're going to do a seven week series on that. I'm excited about it. Um, I, I try to preach through a couple of books of of the Bible each and every year, uh, but I do like variety and. Um, here is Titus, and I've never taught through this one, so I'm excited about that. Um, Paul wrote a letter to a young man named Titus in the ministry, and he sent him to a place called Crete. It is an island uh, south of Greece, and uh, Crete is the uh, fifth largest island in the Mediterranean Sea, and it's the largest and most populous of the Greek islands. Uh, if you're wondering how big Crete is, it is over two times larger than Long Island in New York, if that gives you an idea. But we're going to look at how to build a disciple-making church, and I look forward to that. J. Vernon McGee said, The ideal church is one that has an orderly organization. It's sound in doctrine, pure in life, and ready for every good work. And you're going to find that in this uh, letter to Titus, and that's what we're going to look at today. Um, I found a quote that reminded me of something. Uh, D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo in their commentary on Titus said that the letter or the book of Titus brings out something of what we might call the civilizing function of Christianity. They called it the civilizing function of Christianity. And that reminded me uh, of what they were talking about. Look for just a moment in Titus 1 verse 12. Uh, just to give you an idea of what Titus was up against, and just to give you an idea of what Crete was like, Paul quoted one of their own poets or prophets. It says here in Titus 1.12, one of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and then Paul says this testimony is true. How about that? So if you go to the island of Crete back in Paul's day and time, that was the reputation that the people, the Christians had that lived on the island. And so it almost gives you a barbaric feel, if you will. And I was reminded of their quote about the civilizing function of Christianity. And then I remember what a wise man shared with me years ago. He says, Corey, whenever the gospel is preached, it does three things. Whenever the gospel is preached, it civilizes all, it moralizes some, and it saves a few. Think about that. If you look at the lens of history, you will find that wherever the gospel is preached, it civilizes all, it moralizes some, and it saves a few. I'm reminded of Romans 1.16 where Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. First to the Jew because the Jews are the ones that had the scriptures. They're the ones that had the patriarchs and the promises and the covenants and the temple and the law and the prophets and ultimately Jesus Christ. But even the Greek, even the, the, the Greeks, people who grew up steeped in idolatry, that could walk through their city, uh, their cities and see all kinds of idols to different gods, and yet they too can be saved. That's amazing. So it's this 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 study that we're going to look at for the next seven weeks reminds me that the gospel does have the power to save lives and change lives. So look, if you will, in Titus 1. We're going to look at just four verses today. Paul, 
a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In his own time, he revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God our Savior to Titus, my true son and our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. I have entitled this uh, message, Establish the Truth. Establish the Truth, because when you begin to... uh, ask the question, how do we build a disciple-making church? It starts with the gospel, and it starts with establishing the truth. And right here in his greeting, this is one of the longer greetings that Paul has in his letters, he really gives us some seeds of thought that help us to establish the truth. Now let me kind of give you the background here. Paul is emphasizing two things. He's a servant of God. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. And for that reason, he's been entrusted with a message. What is the message? It's the gospel. It's the good news that Jesus saves. It's the hope of eternal life. And this hope that he's sharing with you and I, he wants to remind us of three things. Number one, God cannot lie. When God promises eternal life to those who believe and receive the gospel, God cannot, does not lie. Okay, I always there, there, there. I could preach a good sermon someday on things that God can't do. Okay, number one, God can't lie because He always tells the truth. Another thing I would say is God can't learn, and you might go, "Well, that sounds awful." No, wait a minute. He already knows everything. Think about it. How can you learn if you already know everything? And God obviously does. He's all knowing. He's almighty. He's all powerful. But God cannot lie. Not only do we have this hope of eternal life based on a promise from God who cannot lie, but this promise was before time began. There in verse 2, he promised it before time began. And then, of course, in his own time, there in verse 3, he has revealed this through preaching. It kind of reminds me of how Paul opened up with the same thought in mind in 2 Timothy. So if you turn left a couple of pages, 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, here's another way of saying it that Paul said to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8, Paul said, Don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. See, the gospel is the power of God to those who believe. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. There it is. This has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And for this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. And that is why I suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, because I know whom I believed, and I persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Isn't that good? Uh, Paul is telling us, listen, I I want you to be established in the truth. God has appointed me as a servant, as an apostle. I'm preaching the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves. It gives you the hope of eternal life. And God cannot lie. God promised this before time began, and now he has brought it to light through the preaching of his word. Okay, through the preaching of his word. And so I want to highlight four things for you. Uh, today, four realities that help us establish the truth. Now, these may sound simple, but I want you to follow me for a moment. The first thing, the first reality that we see that establishes the truth is that God's people believe God's word. That's not earth shattering, that's basic. But, but watch this God's people do believe God's word. In Titus 1, he talks about how he is a servant of God, an apostle of Christ for the faith of God's elect. 
God's elect is a term that refer to God's people. It's a term that Paul has used in the past. Matter of fact, in Romans 8, 33, Paul says, who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, okay? Uh, God's elect refers to God's children, God's people. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are part of that. But then he also uses that term again in the pastoral letters, again in 2 Timothy. Go back a page or two to the left. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says, This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. In other words, Paul says, I know that God has sent me to share this message that Jesus saves, and I don't know who's going to be or who's not, but it's my job to tell everybody. And so that's what he does. And so he goes and he shares the gospel because he knows that God's word will not return void, that there will be people that will hear it, believe it, and respond to it with faith. And that's why he goes through all the things that he goes through, the persecution, the imprisonment, the mistreatment uh, of the gospel for the sake of those that are going to be saved. Now what this tells me is that faith has an object. Now, what do I mean by that? If you go and you talk to people out in society today, you know, do you believe in God? Well, first of all, you have to define what do you mean by believe and what do you mean by God? We're at that point in our culture today. Well, what do you mean by believe? Well, I'm not talking about mental assent. I'm not saying, yeah, I believe that's plausible. I believe that's possible. But do you believe with all your being that this is true? And then when we talk about God, we're not talking about a God that's, that's um, designed by Hollywood, a God that's a figment of your imagination, God, a God that you create in your own mind that's the best of this and that religion that you're putting together, but the God of the Scriptures, the God of the Bible. Uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of Moses, that God. So what it tells me is while some people have faith in faith, whatever that is, Christians place their faith in Jesus Christ, and that is the difference. And so in order to establish the truth here, we need to understand that God's people believe God's word. We believe what God has said to us in and through his word. Um, John 5, verse 37, or 38, excuse me, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, the religious people of his day, and he basically got this blunt with them. Listen to what he said. He said, you don't have his word, referring to God, you don't have his word residing in you. Now, I want to stop there for a minute because you might go, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Brother Corey, these were the Pharisees. They grew up in a religious area. They grew up in a religious home. They memorized the book. What do you mean they don't have his word residing in them? Well, here's the rest of what Jesus said. He says, you don't have his word, God's word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. You pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them and yet they testify about me, but you're not willing to come to me so that you may have life. Now, John's gospel starts out like this. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then uh, verse 14 says, and that word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the living word of God. This written word of God points to, testifies about the living word of God, which is Jesus Christ. Um, when Jesus comes back riding on that white horse in Revelation, he's called the word of God. He is the living word of God. He embodies all of the truth that we know about God in him, he lives it out. He is, faith, faith is in Christ and truth is, is Christ. Truth is not a principle, truth is a person, okay? Truth is a person. For a Christian, truth is more than just a principle or an idea that you, that you discuss and dialogue with others. It is a person and his name is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. And that 
That is what the Word of God says. Let, let me give you another verse to, to help you understand what I'm saying. Jesus was saying, look, you think that you're okay with God because you have the Bible, you know the Bible, you've read the Bible, you've even memorized the Bible, but if you don't come to me, which this is what the Word talks about, it points to me. If you refuse to come to me, you don't have eternal life. You don't have life at all. Uh, here's another way to say the same thing. Paul, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 14, Paul is talking to young Timothy, and he says, As for you, Timothy, continue in what, in, continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, specifically his mother and grandmother, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I love that, don't you? You know, you can, you can hear the Word of God read. You can listen to it being taught all your life. But you don't wise up until you realize that this book talks about sin and salvation and a Savior and sin is the problem that we all have. Salvation is what God makes possible, and it's through a Savior, and His name is Jesus. And until we come to Him, we have missed the whole point of what this is for. And so God's people believe God's Word. I'd say it this way. The purpose of the Word of God is to point people to the Son of God. And if we don't do that, then we've missed the boat of what the Bible is all about. There's a second reality that I want to highlight that establishes the truth. The first one, God's people believe God's Word. The second one, God's Word produces godliness in God's people. Let me say that again. God's Word produces godliness in God's people. Now, this is important, and here's why. Because think about who Paul's writing to and where he's at. He's writing to a young man in the ministry that's on the island of Crete. Like he's literally on an island, and once you get on that island, there's nowhere to go except on the island. Right, Devin? You've been there, done that. And here, the people on that island have a reputation that they are liars, that they are... Um, uh, what does he say there? Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Boy, that sure does sound promising, huh? And we're taking this gospel, this life-changing, soul-saving gospel, and we're going to see these people, even these people, these Greek barbaric people on an island, totally change their ways, totally change their life. God's word produces godliness to God's people. Now, why is this important? Because Christians aren't perfect. We know that. Uh, they've been forgiven, praise God. But they have been changed by the grace and power of God. Here's what I want to say. Don't let the fear of disappointing God keep you from coming to Christ. I know one time I was sharing the gospel with someone and... Uh, they basically said, you know, they grew up in church. They knew, they knew what the book said about right and wrong, but they never made a decision because they didn't want to let God down. They didn't feel like they could live up to the standards of the Bible. And while I appreciate their honesty, it makes me go, none of us can live up to that on our own. That, that sums up the problem, does it not? None of us are righteous. No, not one. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Except for the grace of God, there go I. And so you and I, when we come to Christ just as we are, He will take us, He will save us, and then because He saves us, he changes us. We're not the same person anymore. The old is gone. The new has come. We're a new creature in Christ. And God's word produces godliness in his people. He's the one that does that. Let me give you an example. It's found in 1 Corinthians 6. And you know, the, the church at Corinth, they had a reputation. 
I mean, to Corinthianize, that was a term back in those days. It was loaded with meaning and it wasn't very flattering. And so Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and he reminded them of who they were without Jesus and who they become through Jesus. Let me read that for you. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9, 10, and 11. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom, and some of you used to be like this. Did you catch that? All of those things he mentioned in verse 9 and 10, when he gets to verse 11, he says, and such were some of you. Some of you used to live just like that. But what happened? He says, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, I love that he gave credit to two things, not just Jesus, but the Spirit of God. Why is that important? Because when you and I receive Christ into our life, he gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of me and you if we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what makes us holy. That's what changes our life is because now we are, or we are indwelt by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And that makes all the difference in the world. And now you begin to obey the word of God and it changes you from the inside out. Now let me give you another verse real quick. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Paul was encouraging the church at Thessalonica and he says in verse 13, he says, this is why we constantly thank God because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. When you see that the word of God points to the son of God and you come to the foot of a bloodstained cross and ask Christ to come into your life and he saves you, then all of a sudden when you read this book, it's alive and it speaks to you and, 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 it, and it, 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 it encourages you and it builds you up and it does things inside of you that produces godliness in your life. It changes you from the inside out. Well, we got a couple more. Another reality that establishes the truth that I want you to see God's people believe God's word. God's word produces godliness in God's people. And number three, God's people are called to share the gospel. They are called to share the gospel. There in verse three, he says, In God's own time, he has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God our Savior. He calls God our Savior. And so you and I, we are to share the gospel. We need to let people know that sin is the problem. Salvation is the cure and it's found in a Savior and His name is Jesus Christ. And so here in Mark 16, I'm reminded, reminded of one of the commissions that Jesus gave. Uh, the one in Mark 16 verse 15, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. This good news is for everybody, so go out and share it. And then in Acts 1.8, to make that mission uh, doable and actionable, he gives us stages and steps. In Acts 1.8, he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Just like throwing a, a pebble in a pond and it has that ripple effect, those concentric circles. That's what happens when you and I receive the power of God and we decide to be a witness for Jesus Christ. It starts at home and it just keeps on going until it goes around the world. You and I are to share the gospel. I'd ask some of them on Wednesday night, you know, who did God use to share the gospel with you? Think about that and then... Return the favor and pay it forward. Who can you share the gospel with that needs to hear it? There's a fourth reality 
that Paul shared to establish the truth. God's people believe God's word. God's word produces godliness in God's people. God's people are called to share the gospel. And number four, all of God's people have the same benefits in Christ. Let me say that again and I'll explain it. All of God's people have the same benefits in Christ. Years ago in the church where Nancy and I met, there was a guy that had been an alcoholic and he got saved and he started coming to church. And we really had to help him along because he had no church background. He had lived a rough life. And whenever he got discouraged or down, he would come to you and he goes, "Uh, Brother Corey, can I talk? I'm not a super Christian like you. And we had to go, hold up. I don't know what you mean by a super Christian. I hadn't met a super Christian I don't know a super Christian. And we had to just, we had to start him at ground zero. Nobody lived the Christian life except for Jesus Christ. And Paul said in Galatians 20 that I am crucified with Christ and yet I live. Why? Because he lives in me. Okay? So I don't have it all together. Nobody else has it all together. But I have learned to deny myself. I'm dying to myself daily. I'm letting him live his life in me and through me. I'm taking it one day at a time. Some days are obviously better than others. But there's no super Christians. And that's what he's saying here in verse 4 to Titus, my true son. He affirmed his salvation there. My true son. In other words, I know your testimony. In our common faith. You know, the ground is level at the cross. Nobody has an advantage over anybody else. We all need Jesus. We all receive Jesus, and that is enough. Romans 5, verse 1, Paul said, Therefore, we've been declared righteous by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also also obtained access through Him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character. And character produces hope. And this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Isn't that good? You know, if you're a child of God, you've got the same Holy Spirit that I do. You serve the same God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead as I do. You have the same thing that I do. The the grace in which we stand is because of Jesus Christ. And there are no super Christians. Now, let's put all this together. How can we become established in the truth? I'm going to give you three quick things and listen fast because this is going to be fast. How do we, now that we know these things that Paul highlighted, how can we become established in the truth? Number one, place your faith in Jesus Christ. Remember what I said a while ago? I said that the, the whole purpose of the Word of God is to point people to the Son of God. We could spend all of our lives reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and memorizing the Bible. And if we never come to know Jesus Christ, we have completely missed the point of the whole thing. We've got to let the Word of God point people to the Son of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul defined the gospel. He said, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve, and it goes on from there. That is the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And through that, He saves you and I and anyone who comes to Him with faith. Romans 1, I said it earlier, In this message, I'll say it again. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. And in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? That's the first thing you have to do to become established in the truth. The second thing is to understand the benefits we have in Christ. 
You heard me say a while ago in verse 4 about our common faith that the ground is level at the cross, that there are no super Christians, that we all serve the same God. We have the same Lord. We are indwelt by the same Holy Spirit. Well, I want you to realize that once you place your faith in Christ, understand the benefits we have in Christ. And that's why in Colossians 2, Paul wrote this, I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery which is Christ now Paul was writing to a church in Colossae and he says they've got it they've got the testimony they've got Christ in their life but I want them to understand all that that means and so he goes on in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge I am saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable for I may be absent in body But I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. You don't move on to something else. Once you get saved, you you, you don't say, okay, now that I've checked that box, what, what do I do now? No, you continue to live in Christ. Now that you've received Christ, you continue to live in him, walk with him, depend on him, draw your strength and everything that you need from him because he is your life. Second Peter said it this way, that God has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Isn't that good? In other words, God has given you everything you need for life and for godliness if you're in Christ. So how do we become established in the truth? Place your faith in Christ, understand what that means to be in Christ, and then live out your calling to follow Christ and share the gospel. Peter said, In your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who ask you for a reason for the hope that is in you. In other words, Peter said, you know, live your life for an audience of one, live it for Christ, and always be ready to tell people the reason for the hope that you have. When they go, there's something different about you. What is it? You can say, it's Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what he did for me. And at that point, you're not talking about truth as an idea. You're talking about truth as a person. His name is Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No man can come to the Father except through him. There is only one name under heaven whereby men can be saved, and that is the name of Jesus. And so we need to realize that. I'll close with this. In Matthew chapter 5, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he said, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they can see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let's live out this life before men and be ready to tell them the reason why we have this hope. That's what it's all about. That is the truth of the gospel in Christ. And that was the gospel that Paul was reminding Titus of that he had received, he had believed, and now he was called to share it with a group of people on an island that were known for liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And yet it would change their life. I want to tell you something. No matter how dark the culture gets today, no matter how far society goes away from God, the message in this book, how the Word of God points people to the Son of God, the good news of Jesus Christ, that through His death, burial, and resurrection, anyone can be saved if they'll come to a foot of a bloodstained cross and place their trust and faith in Jesus. That can change their life. can change their life. It's changed mine. I know for many of you, it's changed yours. And that's why we can have confidence in the power of God. That's why we can have confidence in the power of the gospel. That's why when Paul wrote to Rome, which was the the center of everything in his day and time, he said, hey, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. 
but even for the Greek. And I bet people said, what? What did he say? Even the Greek? Even those idolaters? Even those, those people that worship many gods? You mean this gospel can save them? You mean it can change them? And Paul would say, absolutely. Absolutely. And I want to encourage you today. We're going to have a moment of invitation. And I, again, want to remind you that you can grow up in church. You can read the Bible. You can study the Bible. You can memorize the Bible. Oh, my goodness. You can even teach the Bible. But if you never allow this book to give you wisdom unto salvation by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you've missed the point of the book. Don't let that happen to you. And so I want to encourage you today as we have this gospel invitation. If you've come to a point in your life where you go, you know, sin is my problem. Salvation is what I need then you need to meet the Savior today. His name is Jesus Christ. He came. He lived the life that you and I should have lived. He died the death that you and I deserve. He rose from the dead on the third day, just like he said he would. And now he offers the hope of eternal life to anyone who believes. Maybe God's speaking to you today as we stand, as musicians come, and as we pray. Father, I come before you right now. Have your will and your way in the service and during this time of invitation. Lord, I pray that you would let your Holy Spirit, Lord, turn the light bulb on this morning. Lord, help us to realize, Father, that we can pour over the Scriptures, but we must come to the one that you've sent, the one that the Word of God speaks of, and that is the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray if there's someone here today that's never took that first step to trust and follow you, Lord, I pray that it would happen today. Let it be today. Father, have your will and your way in this service. Help us to be established in the truth so that we can live it out and share it with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh, God, how I need you Lord, I come Confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, need him don't we and we never get past that once we actually receive him into our lives we learn to depend on him for the rest of our lives and I want to tell you that makes all the difference in the world I pray that you'll come back tonight as we have a lot of guests with us tonight with the upward banquet week one of two for that and let's just show some love and and encourage them as they come to our church you know a prime opportunity they're coming to us how often does that happen so I want to encourage you to be here for that tonight alright well God bless you enjoy the week uh, Brother Donnie Simpson would you dismiss this brother in prayer